So there's one more thing we can take a look at while we're here, which is another way we can verify that our machine code program has actually been stored into these memory locations, which is by using the built-in debugger, which comes with this ZX spin assembler environment. And we can get to that by going up here to the tools menu and go down to debugger. It opens this window here for us. And if we want to check these memory locations, you can see down here, there's a window that displays addresses with the bytes that are contained in those addresses. And these addresses are in either hexadecimal or decimal, depending on how this debugger has been configured. And we can change that actually in one of these menu items here under view, where it says hexadecimal. Right now it's showing decimal numbers are being displayed in our window. And if we wanted, we could change that to hexadecimal. So if I click on that, for example, you can see all these values have now changed into hexadecimal values with letters here like FD, for example, and you can see the preceding dollar sign in front of the characters, which indicates that the values are hexadecimal values. So let's just go back here and change them back to decimal. And now let's see if we can verify that our machine code program here has actually been stored into these memory locations beginning at memory address 30,000. So in order to do that, we can go to view and go down here to go to, and we want to go to a particular address. And the address we want is 30,000. So we'll type that in and we'll press OK. And now you can see the window displays addresses for us, including 30,000, which is highlighted here. And 30,000 contains, well, here it's showing as containing two bytes of data, but actually the byte of data that's in address location 30,000 is this one here, which is 62, which matches our basic program output up here. 30,000 contains 62. And then 255 would be in the next memory location, which would be 30,001. But it shows them together on the same line here, because if you look up here at our assembly language program, the instructions in line two of our program contain LDA and FF, which are two bytes. And so our output window here shows us two bytes of data starting at address location 30,000. So that means our next address that's shown in this window 30,002 should be showing us the bytes of our next program instruction, which up here would be LDHL 50,000, which we know should contain three bytes which it does if you look over here at our basic outputs, it should contain the bytes 33, 80, and 195. And that's exactly what it shows us here, 33, 80, and 195. And then we can check the rest of our program. Value 119 is in address location 30,005, which matches our basic output. And then 30,006 should contain the value of 201 in decimal, which it does, as you can see down here. Let's take a look at this debugger window one more time and see what else it can show us. So we've already confirmed that the bytes of our machine code program have been properly stored into memory. But in addition to just the bytes of data stored in the memory, it also shows us the equivalent assembly language instructions that were entered to generate those bytes of data. And they should match the assembly language program we typed up here in our assembler. And if you see down here where it says LDA comma 255, that matches the first instruction of our program, LDA comma hexadecimal FF. And if we really want to confirm that, we can simply go down here to view and turn on this hex numbers option. And now our 255 decimal has been converted to FF, which exactly matches the instruction we entered into our assembler program. And if we go back and change this to view the decimal numbers again, we can take a look at our next instruction, LDHL 50,000, which exactly matches what we entered into our assembler. And the next command, LDHL with brackets, comma A, matches again what we entered into the assembler. And the final instruction return, of course, matches the return instruction that we entered into our program as well. And one final thing we can take a look at before we go is over on the right hand side of the debugger output window here, we see that it's actually showing us, among other things, the contents of the registers that we discussed at the beginning of the video. So here we can see PC, which stands for program counter, and the AF register pairs the BC register pair, the DE register pair, the HL register pair, the IX register pair, the IY register pair, the I register, the R register, as well as here is the alternate register set. So these 
Regular registers over here on the left are also duplicated in the Z80 microprocessor with alternate registers, which are these ones with a little apostrophe after them. And if we wanted to, we could switch back and forth between the normal and alternate register sets as we're programming our assembly language programs. And here it's combined the registers into pairs, although we can use them individually in our programs. For example, A, F, B, C, D, E, H, and L can all be used as individual registers. They don't have to be combined into pairs. And in fact, if we go over to the view menu here, we can actually tell the debugger whether we want it to show us the individual 8-bit register values, or if we turn this check mark off, so that selection is no longer enabled, it will now show us the combined 16-bit register pair values. So if we go over here and take a look at our register values now, we can see that the register pair values are being shown to us as 16-bit values. And here, for example, the AF register pair has a value of 84, and the BC register pair contains a value of 5921. So now if we go back over here and turn on this 8-bit register selection, we can see in our register output that the individual 8-bit registers are split out into their individual values. And for example, we see the A register now contains a value of 0, and the F register contains a value of 84, and the B register contains a value of 23, the C register contains a value of 33, and so on and so forth. So we can use this selection here under the View menu to tell the debugger whether we want to display individual 8-bit register values or if we would like to see combined 16-bit register pair values. And if you take a look down here where it says flags, it's also showing us the individual bits that are contained within this F register, which, as you may remember, stands for the flag register. So this F flag register has been broken down for us here, and we can actually see the individual bits of that flag register and which ones are turned on and which ones are turned off, indicated by these little check marks here. So we're going to be covering the flag register and the other registers in later upcoming videos. But for now, we have a good overview, I think, of this ZX Spin Assembler tool and how we can use it to enter our assembly language programs. And one last thing we might want to take a look at is how we can actually load and save our programs from within this ZX Spin emulator. So if we go over here to File, there are actually two options we have. Well, at least two options. There's two I'm aware of. And they are to load and save a snapshot or to load and save a binary file. So let's try doing both of those. So the binary file will save only the data that's stored in memory rather than storing our program or anything else. So first let's try that. Let's save our binary file, which is our actual machine code program. So in order to do that, we simply click on Save Binary File. And here it comes up with the default value of where it's going to save it. And let's just change that because I've already actually saved it as this name here. But let's type in a new name. Let's say Let's call it our binary file, and I'll click Save. But that doesn't actually save it. All that does is fill in the information into this window here. So we need to finish filling this out. And you can see here I've already filled in the start address of 30,000, because that's where our machine code program starts, and the length of the data, which is 7 bytes of data, which you can enter a higher value if you want, and it will simply just save more bytes into memory. But in this case, I know that our program is 7 bytes long. As we can see from our output here, there are 7 bytes displayed on our window. So I'm going to save those 7 bytes of data from the computer memory into a file, which I've labeled as our binary file. So I'll click Save here. Now another thing we can do is go to File and select Save Snapshot. Now what that's going to do is actually save not just the data that's in memory, which it will save that, but it will also save the state of our emulator, which means it will save our basic program as well as what's currently displayed on the screen even. So you can see here it's going to be saved in the ZX Spin Snapshots folder and you can save it wherever you like. And let's give it a name, let's say our snapshot. And when you save the snapshot, you have to give it an extension which is a period followed by a three-letter identifier. And you can see those indicated down here, which ones you should use. You can choose either .SNA, .Z80, .SZX, or .TZX. And I'm not sure what all those different extensions do, but I'm just going to choose .SNA because that seems to be the abbreviation for snapshot, at least I'm assuming. 
So we need to type that in here, otherwise it won't save our program properly. And if I try to save it without indicating an extension, let me just try that and see what happens. You see it brings up this window here asking us to enter an extension for our program. So I'll cancel that and I'll try saving it again as a snapshot. So this time I'll type in the file name, what did I call it before? Our snapshot, our snapshot. And this time I'll give it a file extension of let's say .sna and I'll click save. So now we've saved both a binary file, which is the machine code program from memory. And we've also saved a snapshot, which is the machine code program, the basic program, and the actual entire state of the emulator. So now let's reset our emulator by clicking this button down here. And now our basic program is gone. And if we open up our debugger again, and we view memory location by clicking view, go to address, 30,000, which is where our machine code program was stored before, you can see that address 30,000 and the locations after it all contain zero now. So our machine code program has been erased from memory. So I'll go ahead and close this debugger window. And let's first of all, load our binary file. So we'll do that by clicking file, load binary file. And here it's indicating that it's going to load the file named our binary file, which is what we called it. And we can search for it manually and find it here under our binary files folder, which I've created. And our file name is called our binary file. So if I click on that and click open, that'll fill in the information for this window. And then we click load to load it. So now if we open up our debugger and take a look at memory location 30,000 by clicking view, go to address 30,000. Now we can see that our machine code program has been loaded back into memory beginning at address 30,000. So now let's close this debugger window again and reset our emulator once again. And now this time let's try loading our snapshot, which is right here. And our snapshot was called our snapshot. And if we open that, you can see it loads the state of the emulator, including the output that was on the screen. So it's showing us the output that was on the screen here. And if we take a look at our program listing, our basic program has now returned. And if we take a look at the debugger again, to look at the memory locations to confirm if our machine code program has actually been restored as well, we can go to view, go to address once again, and type in our 30,000. And now, Yep, there's our machine code program loaded back into memory as well. So that's a handy way we can save either just the machine code program by itself as a chunk of memory, or we can save the entire state of the emulator, including the machine code program, the basic program, and even what happened to be printed on the screen in the basic output of the emulator. So that's pretty cool. So there we go, we've successfully created our first assembly language program for the Z80 microprocessor and we're ready to begin making programs for the ZX Spectrum Next computer. I want to thank you for sticking with me this far. I know we've covered a lot of information and hopefully it all made sense to you and you were able to follow along with me because now we're ready to begin making some Z80 assembly language programs and we can continue on with our journey and see how far we can get in creating some cool games for the ZX Spectrum Next computer. And of course, as always, if anyone would like to help support me on this journey by becoming a Patreon subscriber, feel free to head over to patreon.com forward slash SpriteWorks and where you can check out the different subscription levels and the rewards available to you there and see if any of those appeal to you. And as always, I'm happy to have you along with me on this journey and we'll see how far we can get and we'll just keep going forward and learning more as we go along. So again, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. I want to thank you for sticking with me this far. I know we've covered a lot of information and hopefully it all made sense to you and you were able to follow along with me.